So next, uh, we'll talk about some of the uh, way that DNA is made from a uh, DNA template, right, or replication of DNA. And this, of course, is the beginning of the central dogma, where DNA, right, makes DNA and can be also transcribed to RNA, which along with the help of proteins and other RNA is expressed as protein. So we're going to focus mostly on this replication portion here. So there are many enzymes that are involved in the pulling apart of the double helix and then the binding of appropriate enzymes, the replication, and the sealing back together of the double helix. And the first of those is helicase. Helicase is going to serve to break hydrogen bonds. You would imagine it probably has some amino acids that are going to go in and interfere by forming their own hydrogen bonds. And it forms not an entire single strand, but it forms a segment, okay, of single stranded nucleotides. Right? This is known as the replication bubble. So if you have the hydrogen bonds shown here in the center, then we'll see that after helicase does it work does its work, it's going to open up. So they are now broken. And of course, I've written these from five to three and three to five. Of course, in an anti-parallel sense. Primase is going to be responsible for installing a short RNA primer or an RNA sequence. And the relevance of this uh, is that that RNA sequence at, at its three prime end is going to have a free alcohol. And that alcohol is necessary for priming or for beginning the process of DNA synthesis or chain elongation. So DNA polymerase cannot do synthesis de novo, which is quite different from RNA polymerase. which means it cannot just start from scratch. So if this is the DNA that has already been uh, pulled apart in terms of hydrogen bond cleavage, uh, then we'd have two segments of single strand and in a five to three prime direction, we would install the primer or the RNA sequence, okay? Or G bonds with C, C bonds with G, A bonds with U, right? And T bonds with A. And off of A, you would have that free three prime hydroxyl. And then DNA could be added on from there. Later on, of course, that primer will have to be removed. Okay, I'm only showing that from one side here, okay? But the, it would be the same idea that at the start point, you have to have a few nucleotides upstream that form the appropriate primer uh, for synthesizing that first phosphodiester bond of DNA. So topoisomerase is an interesting enzyme uh, in that it relieves Topo, uh, I guess topological stress, um, or it is going to uh, help the molecule interconvert between various topoisomers. And think of topological as being like the three-dimensional supercoiling of the structure. And this stress uh, is particularly enhanced and created by the DNA replication machinery that is moving along uh, the double helix. Most of that stress is caused by 
the unwinding with helicase into single stranded DNA. So topo isomerase, uh, there are types one and types two and there's subtypes from there, uh, but basically they're going to cut or cleave a phosphodiester bond And I'm showing that phosphodiester of interest here, red. And then they would allow this to unwind into some other three-dimensional shape. And then they will reseal that bond. So they are able to cleave and also reform phosphodiester bonds after unwinding. Sometimes they actually wind them more uh, in other biological scenarios. And like I said, there are many subtypes of topoisomerase. Um, many of them are ATP dependent and uh, use tyrosine residues uh, for covalent type catalysis. Um, but you don't need to go into that detail in this course. Um, I would just know uh, that there are types one and two, okay? Type one cleaves one strand of the double helix. And type two cleaves both strands of the double helix. But overall, uh, the topoisomerase is assisting with this idea of the linking number L, which is equal to the number of twists and rides. Okay, and those variables aren't too important at this level, but um, that sort of measures the the coiling or supercoiling and tertiary structure of the DNA. And that linking number is a constant. So twist and writhe, uh, if one goes up, the other goes down. And topoisomerase allows to change that linking number if it means that the DNA is becoming too coiled uh, during DNA synthesis. Polymerase three, of course, is the uh, enzyme responsible for the majority of DNA uh, chain elongation. And it's actually been recently found that there are three polymerases that are active uh, during eukaryotic DNA uh, synthesis, but this one is the powerhouse and that's going to synthesize the majority of phosphodiester bonds. We'll see in a minute that a small number of those phosphodiester bonds are synthesized by uh, polymerase one. So after DNA Paul three comes in here, you'll see that the RNA primer is going to be added on to. This is happening on both strands, but I'm just going to draw it on one where it forms a new phosphodiester bond with the incoming, let me move this down here for base pairing reasons. Adenine in that case. So we know that this is going to do it in a five to three prime directionality where there is now a new free prime hydroxyl, free three prime hydroxyl at the new nucleotide that can then undergo another SN2. So this reaction uh, is SN2-like, I don't like to call it an exact SN2. Uh, nucleophilic attack of the hydroxyl, so this is the three prime position of an adenine. 
and that is the nucleophile. And at the five prime of the incoming NTP, okay, we will see this mechanism occur where the oxygen attacks the phosphate. But it only attacks that phosphate because, as I mentioned, a very important divalent cation in solution is coordinating to those phosphates. And it attacks the phosphate that is closest, of course, to the ribose ring. So we lose the beta and gamma phosphates as a byproduct. Okay, you could probably draw it as an addition, break the carbonyl type bond or the phosphorus oxygen bond, reform that bond, but eventually the result is just that you cleave this phospho and hydride bonds, which we know is very unstable. So the magnesium's role is that it's going to increase the electrophilicity or the delta positive character at the alpha phosphate, the one nearest the ribose. And what you'll have after this, I'm going to abbreviate it, but you'd have A phosphodiester bond to another A. Where that first A had a five prime phosphate and the new one has a three prime OH. So the new bond we have formed via the arrow pushing before is here. And the byproduct of this is pyrophosphate. Pyrophosphate is this phospho and hydride linkage between two inorganic phosphates, which I'll show here. Of course, it has a great deal of negative charge density. And the driving force for this reaction is not so much the formation of the phosphodiester bond, but it's this hydrolysis that the side product or the pyrophosphate undergoes with water. So nucleophilic addition elimination uh, cleaves that bond and gives you two free inorganic phosphates, which could be protonated or deprotonated in solution. As I mentioned, this is very, very favorable, both enthalpically and entropically, as you have now separated, right, or placed apart uh, negative charge density, right, and each of these is stabilized by more resonance forms than they had when they were connected via a phospho and hydride bond. So we'll see that pyrophosphate leaving group, specifically where it was the beta and the gamma phosphates, those often provide an exergonic process that can overcome an uphill process, okay? Or they are a driving force. That's common with a lot of um, glyc glycogen synthesis enzymes. So one other thing I wanna notice, or I want you to notice, is that the uh, alpha phosphate here of the incoming uh, DNTP is the phosphorus if labeled, that will show up in that new oligonucleotide. So if you're asked a question about phosphorus 31 or 32 radio labeling, then you would find, uh, of course, that the radio label is only present if it was the alpha phosphorus or the alpha phosphoryl group of that incoming nucleotide, which were labeled. So the sliding clamp, uh, this is going to do exactly what it sounds like, or it's going to kind of clamp and force DNA polymerase three and all the other necessary machinery uh, to the double helix. And prevent dissociation of this machinery. 
it slides along the helix, okay, with the polymerase. In other words, um, this enzyme is important because we don't want DNA polymerase to be making half a strand and then falling off and making another quarter of it, right? That would be a very inefficient process for cell division. So uh, we need DNA polymerase to be able to latch on, slide along the whole strand and, and replicate the whole thing without taking a long and efficient time. Uh, so that process uh, or the ability of DNA to stay on the double strand is known as the processivity. So sliding clamp is the main player that is responsible for increasing the processivity of DNA polymerase. Now I mentioned there was another polymerase as well that's very important. Um, so the polymerase machinery moves along uh, in a bi-directional manner where uh, helicase unwinds and breaks hydrogen bonds uh, at one segment and we have exposed some of the templates so remember that we're synthesizing in a five to three direction no matter what polymerase we're using So if the polymerase uh, is moving in both directions, okay, uh, then we are synthesizing both leading and lagging strands. And the leading strand is synthesized via continuous synthesis, or we do not have to do it in multiple fragments. So that's the strand that really relies on that high processivity that I mentioned before. And uh, the lagging strand is going to be synthesized discontinuously. So that discontinuous synthesis, which I'm going to show you above, is done by the eventual linking together of Okazaki fragments, where the individual isolated fragments of the lagging strand. Okay, so going back to this, right, we said that we're making DNA at both ends here, three prime, five prime, five prime to three prime. So if the DNA is moving to the left and to the right, okay, or we are moving along I should say, I'm moving along the DNA segment with machinery in both directions, okay? Then the strands where we have five to three and five to three in correlation with that, these are in the correct direction or these are leading. The other ones I should draw again because they are made in fragments. So here we're going to have five to three, okay, another five to three, these Okazaki fragments. So it will be the job of polymerase one, okay, to excise 
the RNA primer that is laid down for every one of these continuous and discontinuous strands. And to fill the space that was taken by that primer with DNA. So polymerase one does contribute a small percentage of the nucleotides in the double-stranded DNA, much smaller than the majority that are synthesized via polymerase three. But there's going to be more primers that must be excised in the discontinuous lacking strand synthesis because there's a primer for every single right Okazaki fragment. So I'll say more primers must be removed from the lagging strand before it's complete. Which means that a larger percentage of the nucleotides and the lagging strand come from the action of Paul one compared to the leading strand. Now the majority in each still comes from Paul three. Okay. But just know that difference that all the prime is removed by the uh, exo or endonuclease activity of uh, Paul one. And therefore with more primers and lagging strand, you'll get more of those nucleotides added by Paul one in the lagging strand. So exonuclease activity means it's able to cleave DNA or cleave phosphodiester bonds by starting, right, or having the origin of catalysis at either the three prime or the five prime end. And you'll see the uh, directionality in the nomenclature where it's said to be a three to five prime exonuclease or a, a th five to three. Endonuclease, these are also going to cleave uh, phosphodiester bonds and degrade the double stranded DNA uh, or degrade the RNA primer. But they do so from somewhere not at the beginning and not at the end of the DNA sequence. So from somewhere in the middle. Finally, uh, we haven't really talked much about how we put all those. Okazagi fragments together or how we uh, connect the DNA that has replaced the primer with the long elongation strand of DNA and that is done by ligase right or ligase forms phosphodiester bonds and that similar mechanism I showed above um, between the Okazaki fragments and the lagging strand, etc. So that's your uh, DNA replication overview. Um,